Greetings comic lovers and welcome back to Casually Comics, the channel where we chat all things comics from reviews of comics new and old to history to anecdotes really wherever our whims take us. Are you ready for more Green Lantern? Of course you are. We're going to be taking a look at a book that for some has flown under the radar. It looks like at the time of this recording, the lantern we're about to talk about is going to play a role in a future state. However, this book, Far Sector, began being released in November of 2019 and the marketing push behind it was for some a little confusing. It was hard to see how it connected to the bigger continuity picture if it did. And it didn't get the biggest push out there. Especially Especially if one wasn't on social media. Not everybody is scrolling every day through the comic book news. So it might have been a bit easy to miss, which is a shame because it's actually a very interesting Green Lantern story and potentially one a lot of you have been waiting for. I'll get to why at the end. There's a lot to unpack, so let's get to it. But before we get started, I'm Sasha, and if you're enjoying this content, you know what to do. Hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, join us on this comic book journey. Far Sector comes to us from award-winning sci-fi author N.K. Jemisin with art by Jamal Campbell. It was initially part of the DC Young Animal imprint, which sounds like a budget basement party that your parents throw so that you don't go to a real one. This imprint was founded in 2016 and is described as a pop-up imprint. Its goal is to relaunch characters and settings in the DC universe for a more mature audience and to allow for a more experimental approach to these stories, something a bit off the beaten path or perhaps outside of continuity. Confusion as to just what Young Animal is probably didn't help this book either, but that's all done now, let's dive in. Our cover features our new lantern against and partially blended into a galaxy of stars. It's an effect that's been seen before, but I'm always a fan. Makes it look very movie poster-esque, especially when coupled with the title. It has one of those from the author of and artist of tabs. I'm never certain how effective those actually are. How many of you have discovered works that way? I want to know. Or are you more likely to find them by actively looking up the person you're interested in? A man who makes trouble for others is also making it for himself. Chinua Achebe things fall apart. Yes, we're starting with a quote. Yes, that can oftentimes either disconnect or connote pretension. And it may here for you. It's very much a mileage varies type deal. Here, unlike say in the Immortal Hulk, which employs quotes more thematically overall, this serves two functions than the narrative itself and on a bit of a meta level. Our protagonist comments on it. Two little problems with that quote apply to this situation. First, in this case, the trouble isn't mono we mono. Whole city's gonna feel this. Second, I'm the one causing the trouble just by existing but what else is new? So here we have a quote as contrast, but on a more meta level, this is meant to showcase to the reader that our lantern has a different vantage point and perspective, highlighted by her choice in literature. Things Fall Apart, firstly, is an excellent novel. Don't be scared because it's on a lot of post-colonial lit courses. Books can have layers and be worthy of study and also be entertaining and fun to read. Though I know the academia surrounding certain books can put one off of them. Things Fall Apart just deserves to be read more. Things Fall Apart is an African novel, specifically Nigerian, and its usage here is meant to accentuate our lead character character's blackness and connection to it for the reader, to signal that it isn't something the story's unaware of, and just to centralize this perspective and let the reader sit with it, and hopefully showcase that a different perspective can still be a relatable one. Potentially different, because we don't know what subject positioning you are reading this. No assumptions made here. A good author can draw you into pretty much any perspective. This is then built upon by the causing trouble just by existing line. This works doubly as it can be read as the author's stance on existing as a black woman in her case in America, or it can work for the narrative, where she is a lone human out in the far sector of the universe. Oh, I said it. She's in a crime scene, the first murder scene on this world in a little over five centuries, so it's a big deal. This work also has a bit of a neo-noir feel to it, and her tough narration style is reminiscent of those pulp gum shoes. It's even raining. Nobody really knows what to do when she doesn't either, as she's never investigated a murder, but at least she knows they need to get some forensics. And also she feels that she shouldn't be holding their hands, because it's only gonna get worse. We get a gorgeous shot of our pulled back environment, and a name, the City of Enduring. Scott's not real. Each day the city builds a new composite sky image from its citizens' imaginations. Jemison is a sci-fi author, and so a decent amount of this comic is spent building up the sci-fi environment, as well as our lead lantern, who admittedly at times can come off a bit abrasive, such as a running joke she has wherein she will state a character's name, and many of them have run-on sentence style names, and then make the yes, that's a real name joke. Over and over. It happens a few too many times and rounds the corner of, yeah, that is odd, to relate to me. I'm relatable. The line of relatability is a tightrope. She gets summoned to the Council of the Trilogy, representatives of the three species who make up this collective of planets she's been assigned to. We have the Na, the At-At, and a very topical, timeless recording pronunciation joke. I sure hope the At symbol doesn't change meaning. Think of how many jokes were lost when the pound sign shifted. So many dead jokes because of the hashtag RIP. And a Katopli. We see her referred to as the human, which sets up our standard everyone 
everyone hates humans trope. A classic in multiple species sci-fi. I don't feel at home unless fictional aliens are looking down on me. There are no chairs, but our lantern, Joe Mullen, creates some to sit in. However, a little alien pops up inside of one of her chairs. This coupled with the fact that she chose to take a vehicle to this meeting rather than fly gives the reader the hint that something might be wrong with her ring. The council are introduced and there are a lot of little details thrown in. This is in the casual way Mullins describes them. There's a lot of detail work placed throughout, so you can come away with a decent grasp of the world even after just one issue. It's to the point where if I pointed out everything, this review would be over an hour. And we don't have time. I don't have time. Maybe you have time. Martha the sea by the wavering dirk until the sun falls. Yeah, and that bit of extra name means he's extra important among his people. He gets a highlight because he stands out to her and she even calls him acidity ass. Acidity means snobby, by the way. Mullen's narration boxes are written in a slightly, ever so slightly more urban colloquial manner. Again, to give her her own voice, which is rooted in the author's desire to present an authentic black female lantern, at least authentic from an American perspective, and through this author's lens. She wants to allow her protagonist to exist in her own skin. We learn more about the murder, and our victim's name is Steven. It's spelled slightly differently, but it's Steven. And we learn that this is a society that has suppressed their emotions, or rather, don't feel them. Equilibrium says hi. But this is slightly different and lives in but also acknowledges what I like to call the data paradox. That being a character who you're constantly told has no feelings but consistently acts as if they do. The characters in the story are shown as passionate, sniping at each other, exchanging insults, even yelling. And when you hear the word emotionless society, at least for me, I imagine something flatter, perhaps like Vulcans or the neutral people from the neutral plan in Futurama. Tell my wife I said hello. Here what it's explained as is that the people feel nothing, but these displays are cultural, social as it were, like learned behaviors but with no actual feeling behind them. A society of actors almost, going through emotions. It's a fascinating idea, but one that oft times leaves you thinking, wait, they don't have feelings. That seemed hella passionate. Still, it's an interesting workaround for why the characters still act so familiar, though not everyone is going to buy it. And this is where some people may fall off, or feel that the idea is being poorly executed. Although bear in mind, this is only issue one. When you have an arc like this, sometimes secret are revealed later on. We learn that they have the murderer in custody and that the victim was partially eaten. Poor Steven. So it's not a question of who or how, but a question of why. Counselors, you've requested the Green Lantern for the city in Jiren. You knew this was coming. You damn near told me to expect it. The question that really matters right now is, how do we prevent the next one? I love her lipstick. Our lantern then gives us some backstory and emphasizes a point. In a good narrative, who speaks matters, so does who's being spoken to. I told you so. Right there you can see that this story matters to the author. It bursts through in little manifestations like that. That still also managed to work into the narrative and come across better because Joe is a new character. So the voice, it's hers, even if it is tinged with the author's because this is the first presentation, her first manifestation as it were. This iteration of Joe is just being formed and so far she feels pretty solid. We learn about the landscapes of where we are. Two planets, three races growing together until an empire appeared and turned them against each other. We've seen this on Earth. Rwanda, Nazi Germany, presidential elections, a time-tested tactic, divide and conquer. Sci-fi pet peeve here. Making things about Earth. Making things obviously about Earth, rather. No Earth references, please. We have Earth at home. References like this are, of course, meant to help the reader and create a point of common ground that steers them in a certain direction or thought pattern that will be familiar to them. Star Trek does this all the time, too. The thing is, these references always speak to the referencees grounding, meaning that others would use potentially different references to illustrate the same point. For example, if I were writing the same statement, mine would include colonial India. But these can be points where people get stuck or quibble or pontificate, as I'm doing. Narratively, personally, and take this with a grain of salt, all the salt that I can give you, I think it's a stronger statement if it goes like this. We've seen this on Earth. Divide and conquer. Gives more room for the audience to fill things in for themselves. Sometimes less is more and a bit more impactful. Just that silence of, you know what we're talking about. Although then you run into the fact that maybe they don't know exactly specifically what you are talking about, which is why the author then directs them. I get it, it's to establish more of Mullen's perspective. Alongside some topical at the time, digs at the author's locality. The thing is, those don't always work. They don't always potentially age well, or they don't always hit with, say, international readers. Mileage very much varies. What's important is that the people of the trilogy fought back when they get mad they don't play. It was so fierce and destroyed so much that they felt the need to banish anger and just all emotions in general. There's some interesting reads there, but we veered off course enough. Or rather, I veered off course enough. And it worked. The trilogy entered a new golden age, built the city literally from the ashes of their home worlds. Facial expressions and body language are just how people communicate, but they don't mean the same thing here as what I'm used to. No one in this room feels a thing. 
except me. See, this is here because what follows this is an argument. People didn't have feelings for centuries. Would they still be able to keep up these pantomimes of emotion or would they have changed over time, either dulled or become more exaggerated, perhaps out of step, the wrong reaction for the wrong emotion, wrong in quotes. Would it warp over time to the point of ceremony? Questions. Joan leaves to talk with the murderer, but on her way, she pauses for a moment of the day that always gets her. The brief moment when the sky blinks out and shows the true exterior, the moment that made her connect with this world. Alongside that, we see her being given her ring and given a year to test the ring and make a mark, as we see that her ring appears to be different than the usual Green Lantern's fare. Also, the nah she called snobbish comes out to speak with her and low-key flirt with her. And we learn the name of the means by which emotions are dampened or removed, emotion exploit. We also learn that the nah's wingtips are venomous and that she She's kinda into him, despite not really wanting to be. She's fallen into the lowest lane trap, handsome. For that to make sense, check out our lowest getting married playlist. This man's gonna be a goddamn problem. However, when she gets to the precinct to interrogate the murderer, they're dead. Murdered themselves, pretty gruesomely too. They'll let you get away with a lot if the blood is not red. If you got alien blood, robot blood, something else, you can do all kinds of things. 17. Yes. And so our lantern gives chase to the fleeing suspect, ending chapter one. Okay, for real, this is the type of lantern story I've been waiting for for a long time. One that is fully immersed in being a space adventure with Earth far in the rearview mirror, but some more grounded than what happened with the Morrison run where Hal went back to basics and then somehow ended up punching God in the face. An actual space adventure trying to build up a unique environment with new species and aliens and customs. A mystery, plus a narrator giving me some neo-noir sass. This issue packed a lot of info into itself and I didn't get to all of it. If you're at all curious, pick it up for yourself. That and the art is gorgeous. It is going to eventually, once it is complete, end up on the shelf, which these days is a bit of an honor. Hashtag budget, hashtag parent life. Jimison worked hard to give Mullen a unique feel and she succeeds. Now, whether you're gonna like Joe or not is a completely different matter. She makes some intentional statements with her. For example, Joe's whole name is Sojourner. Sojourner Truth was a former slave who became an outspoken advocate and activist for abolition, temperance, and women's rights. So she took none of the nonsense. It's a strong name. Names have power. That would be a very powerful name to carry. It's a statement and some find it unnecessary and aggressive. Others find it bold and inspiring, causing people to seek out histories and references they may be unfamiliar with. Letting Joe take up space and be and cause a reaction, which kind of harkens back to the early line in the story about people being upset about her just taking up space. This is one where if you express not liking it, there are some who may read into it. Like with all characters and stories, they won't be for everyone. And not every dislike comes from a negative place or one of bigotry and malcontent. Some will have, that cannot be denied, but not all. Every story and character can be critiqued. Some may not enjoy the slightly tongue-in-cheek internet speak reference references, or Joe's sass, or may find some of the sci-fi tropes derivative, or as mentioned, not be willing to go along with some of them. In regards to critiquing this work, I believe it's fair to say that the way that this work was treated because of the time it came out was a bit harsh or different than it may have been in other times. All works are subject to the environments in which they are created. And as a result, unfortunately, some may have steered clear of this story because of that. Unfortunately, in my opinion, if you didn't like it, then obviously you'll have a different opinion. I like this. I'm glad it exists. Joe is a strong addition, in my opinion, to the ever-expanding lore and lantern core. The mythos can't stop, won't stop. So many humans in the core. But those are just my opinions. I want to hear what you think. What did you think of this story? Is it one you'll be checking out? Were you two waiting for more stories about lanterns just out in space, far from the earth, and one where they don't punch God in the face? <laughs> I want to hear all your thoughts down below. And while you're down there, please do all the YouTube things. Like, share, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell notification so that you never miss a vid. Thanks so much for taking some time out of your day to spend it discussing comics with me. I always appreciate it and I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.